Hi everyone, welcome to our Sunday worship service. My name is Jeff and I'd like to thank you again for joining us today. I'm excited for the text we're going to be studying today. We're in part two of our two-part series leading up to Easter called Brought to Life. And today we'll be looking at a passage from Mark chapter 5. I'll read for us starting at verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. So I'd like to just pause here for a bit and consider this opening scene. Jesus lands on shore after crossing the Sea of Galilee. He had just come from a harrowing journey, calming a storm, and then healing a man who was driven into the tombs by demons. And it seems as soon as he gets to shore, he's met with another need. Jairus, one of the rulers of the synagogue, came and fell at his feet. A little background here. So after the Jewish diaspora and the destruction of the temple, synagogues became the primary center of religious life. They were formed when 10 households or more gathered, and they were led by people in the community. Jairus was such a person. He was a ruler of the synagogue. This was an elected position, so he was most likely well-known and well-liked. Some commentators note that most rulers of the synagogue were actually Pharisees. So it's interesting. I think this move of Jairus coming to Jesus most likely would have put him in some tension with the religious establishment. But as we see, he's desperate. In verse 23, Jairus gives us his situation. My little daughter is at the point of death. In Luke's gospel, we get the exact age. She's 12 years old. It's a heartbreaking situation. I just want to note a quick lesson here in this opening scene. This well-respected religious synagogue ruler coming to Jesus. I think he could have been hesitant to come. He could have been worried about the cost to his reputation, concerned about his pride. But of course, none of this mattered in the light of his daughter being at the point of death. I think there's some application here for our own lives. Coming to Jesus often entails some social cost. We may feel like we've gained a certain amount of pride in some area of our lives that Jesus threatens. Maybe we've achieved a certain status. Maybe we have some reputation. But I think the lesson here is that if it's a matter of life and death, reconciliation with God and eternal life, we really should not let our pride get in the way. It's kind of like someone refusing cancer treatment because they don't want to lose their hair. Like, sure, it's a cost, but it's so disproportionate. I've seen people who have grown up in the church and they have questions, critical aspects of the faith that they, they really don't understand. But they think, how can I have these questions or how can I have these doubts as someone who's grown up in the church so they stay silent? Or someone really needs to make a decision for Christ. They've got their questions answered and their doubts are satisfied, but then they wonder, how will I be viewed by this or that group? Or sometimes it's in the course of Christian life. You realize you really need to confess something. Be honest and come clean about some area of your life. But maybe you're a little older now. You have some reputation, maybe even a title, and it feels hard. In some way, you have more to lose now than maybe before when you were a younger or a new Christian. I think the humility of Jairus is an example for all of us to never let our pride get in the way of coming to Jesus. So verse 24 says, he went with him. And again, quick observation. I think we see here again the compassion of Jesus. Again and again, throughout the Gospels, the portrait of Jesus is someone who never turned anyone away. So he goes, and the text notes that a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. So imagine the scene, and it's probably pretty chaotic. And it makes sense, Jairus being a prominent figure, most people probably knew about his daughter's situation. And so I imagine there's a lot of excitement and anticipation over what this miracle worker will do. As this great crowd is traveling with urgency to Jairus' house, we're introduced to another character in the story. Verse 25 reads, And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. It's hard for me to imagine a person more polar opposite to Jairus than this unnamed woman. Jairus was well-recognized, important, and a prominent person in the community. This bleeding woman was a female in a male-dominated society, physically ill, ritually unclean, and most likely destitute. Verse 26 is an interesting description. 
She suffered much under many physicians. That's ironic. You're not supposed to suffer under physicians. But it says she spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. That's also not supposed to happen. Not only did she not get better, she actually got worse. It's ironic, but I thought, this is actually kind of true to life. The so-called experts who are supposed to help us deal with the challenges of life, our struggles, our issues, with maturity, do they? Or do they keep giving us advice that further plunges us into confusion? I think about the counsel that we're given sometimes. You can be whatever you set your heart on. You can choose everything. Everything is fluid. Truth is fluid. Morality is fluid. Shirk authority. Trust nobody. Question everything. Except, of course, the legitimacy of your own position to evaluate what you're questioning. And what's the result of this? Well, it sounds like a liberating message, but does it actually lead to any kind of genuine flourishing? And often, I think, rather than getting better, we just get worse. Now, continuing the text, verse 27 reads, She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. This woman sneaks up behind Jesus and touches his garment. Why did she come like this? And I think it makes a lot of sense given who she was. She couldn't ask for healing like Jairus did. She was defiled. She wasn't even supposed to be in the public presence of people. She definitely couldn't stop this important procession. Her greatest hope was most likely to sneak a healing and scurry away unnoticed. But to her dismay, that didn't happen. Reading on, And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. Jesus stops the whole procession and asks, Who touched my garments? Now, I just want to make a quick observation. This woman touches Jesus and is healed, but there was the whole crowd that was touching Jesus. In fact, they were pressing around him. Yet, it's only this woman who makes meaningful contact with Jesus. I think there's a lesson here for us. It doesn't mean a whole lot to be around Jesus. Throughout the Gospel, there was often this ubiquitous crowd that was around Jesus. Yet, it seems very few made meaningful contact with Jesus. The main contribution of the crowd, you could say, was actually just to make it more difficult for the people who were actually seeking Jesus. I think this can serve as a warning for us. Crowds are interesting things. There is the phenomena of mob mentality, when you get swept up in the energy of the mob. And I think it's possible to be around Jesus, to feel a lot of things toward Jesus, to even be moved and inspired by Him, yet never make meaningful contact. I remember my senior year in college, I was never much of a sports fan, but I was about to graduate and I had never been to a big game, the big Cal versus Stanford rivalry. Uh, we were terrible when I was in college. I don't think we won a big game in something like 10 years, uh, but I thought, well, I should go to at least one before I graduate. Well, it turned out that that year we actually won, and it was crazy. We stormed the field, tore down the goalposts, and carried it from Memorial Stadium down Telegraph and set it up in front of Sproul Hall. But the funny thing is, even though I wasn't a football fan at all, I was actually the first person to storm the field, and I totally lost myself in the frenzy of the moment. I think most people looking at me would have concluded that I was a die-hard Cal football fan. But of course, I wasn't. I was just swept up by the crowd and the excitement of the moment. And I think most, if not all of us, have experienced something like this before. But I think a danger of this in spiritual life is that we can sometimes confuse just being swept up by external factors and mistake that for internal personal conviction. I think it's not always one or the other, there are times when the momentum of the crowd can really help us to cultivate our personal conviction, but I think it's something worth considering. To what extent are we just around Jesus, caught up in the excitement of others, or are we making meaningful personal connection with Jesus? And how do we do that? And I think Jairus and the bleeding woman actually provide a good picture. People who are desperate about their condition and are driven to seek Jesus. When we recognize who we are, who God is, in our condition as weak, frail sinners, it will cause us to turn to Jesus. I thought about how perhaps this time of sheltering in place can actually be a unique opportunity to deepen our convictions and cultivate our personal relationship with Jesus. As we're forced to be separated, it's a time when the excitement of the crowd is dialed down a bit. One of the things I'm praying for all of us 
is that this might be an occasion for each one of us to deepen in our personal connection with Jesus. For me, it's been a bit crazy in my household with two little kids craving attention 24-7, but I've been finding pockets of time, particularly in the evening, to have extended times of prayer and times of just reading God's Word, and it's been really refreshing. So back to the story, Jesus keeps looking around to see who had touched him. And it's interesting, he asks this question, who touched me? It's a question that actually only one person in that crowd understood. And for her, I wonder if it felt like the whole crowd emptied out as she heard Jesus speaking to her directly, inviting her to come out. Verse 33 says, But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. The whole truth. This would have been quite a lengthy story. All the information Mark summarizes in verse 26 about suffering under many physicians. Meanwhile, I'm sure Jairus is getting really anxious. But Jesus listens to this woman, gives her the space to tell her story, treating her with dignity. I thought about our elderly care ministry that's unfortunately on hold right now. But I've heard many stories about how often the thing we do that has the greatest impact on the elderly is simply giving them the gift of our listening ear. It's amazing how much humanity is bestowed when someone is genuinely interested in our thoughts and our story. For this woman, I can only imagine to be heard like this, to have your whole story heard by this important rabbi on an important mission. And everybody's listening. Of course, they have to because Jesus is listening. I imagine it would have been so dignifying. This person, who most people wouldn't have even seen, literally as someone defiled, a throwaway in society, but Jesus halts this entire procession for her. And at the end of the whole story, Jesus says to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. It's the only place recorded in the Gospels where Jesus called anyone daughter. Why? Well, who's on everybody's mind? It's Jairus' daughter. And I think Jesus wanted to communicate to her and to everyone in that crowd and to us that to God, this woman is his precious daughter, every bit as much as Jairus' daughter was to Jairus. I think Jesus wanted her to know that she was not in trouble, that she didn't sneak a healing, but rather he wanted to assure her, you are loved, you are known, I meant to heal you. I just want to remind each of us joining today that you're precious to God, that you are a precious son or daughter of God. No matter what society says about you, I think our society often makes us feel so worthless. Our society tells us that we have to perform, succeed, look a certain way, work at a certain place in order to establish our worth. And what if we're not able to? If we're not up to par? Well, our society says then you have no value. You're just a loser. I'm thankful that this story reminds us of the truth, that even if we're forgotten by all of society, we're known and loved by God. Well, meanwhile, this whole ordeal took so long that some people came from Jairus' house to report to him the sad news, your daughter's dead. But Jesus reassures him, tells him, do not fear, only believe. I think Jairus is a pretty neat guy. He's a good man. As this woman is going on and on, perhaps he sees Jesus' face of compassion and he simply waits. And even as he gets this news, he holds on to hope. And of course, we know how the story ends, that Jesus ends up resurrecting this little girl but what's the lesson that we can learn here? I think when God is taking too long, when God seems to delay, we really need to trust him. Because Jairus hung in there, because he doesn't lose faith, he ends up experiencing an even greater miracle and even greater joy. I think we've all been doing a lot of waiting these days, and there's grief and sadness and loss as well. And I don't know how all this is going to end, but I'm holding on to hope that God is able to redeem even the darkest of situations and the most hopeless of times. Jesus tells Jairus, do not fear, only believe. And perhaps that's a timely word for all of us as we navigate through these troubled times.